I'm really delighted to welcome Anthony Stansfield, police commissioner. Commissioner, we're really honored and, and grateful that you're here because we believe that in the public interest, your participation in this event and the message you might take to Parliament will be in the public interest. So at this time, I'd like to give you as much time as you wish with 20 minutes as an outline. And the only question or two that I'll have for you relate to the documents I've already shown you at your convenience. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm an elected person as the Police and Crime Commissioner. I'm elected over the Thames Valley, which is the biggest um, area, really, a non-metropolitan area in the country. It's got about two and a half million people in it. And it represents uh, 21 parliamentary constituencies, mm -hmm. including the Prime Ministers and the last Prime Ministers and um, the number two in government. So I, I have a, a reasonable political voice. Um, I'm in effect an executive chairman of, of law and order across that area. And in 2013, um, we started an investigation into one of the banks. Um, it was uh, a bank that no longer existed, but it had been taken over, but the directors had moved between the two banks. And that was uh, Halifax Bank of Scotland, HBOS, um, which was taken over by Lloyds in 2008, 2009. And it was an extraordinary investigation. Um, Two other police forces had turned it down. The Serious Fraud Office wouldn't look at it. And uh, we did look at it. And it was one family, um, a, a man and wife team called uh, Paul and Nicky Turner, who put the cases together and brought it to Thames Valley. And it looked as though a very large proportion of the crime had been committed out of Reading. And it was a vast fraud and we duly got stuck in and investigated. It took three years during which the bank offered very little support. Um, it was only, we only looked at a, a fraud of 245 million. I think it was a reason for that. It was being deliberately kept below 250 million, which meant if it had been over, it had to be reported um, in all their accounts. And they were very keen not to do it as they were doing rights issues at the time. Um, and after a case, that lasted a very long time and cost us about seven million pounds, should have cost a lot less if we'd had cooperation properly from the bank throughout. Um, the bankers were convicted. It was an interesting one that Lloyds Bank denied the fraud throughout that period. Even when their own banker pleaded guilty, they still denied the fraud. For 10 years they knew about the fraud and for 10 years they had gone for the personal guarantees of the people they had knowingly defrauded. And this bankrupted thousands of people. They had their houses taken away, their homes, people committed suicides, there were divorces, and the sheer misery it caused. And the bank chairman were perfectly aware of it because they were written to by so many victims. And it simply wasn't followed up. And eventually we got the convictions. Um, I think the bank were absolutely horrified we got the convictions. Um, and that happened in, um, at the end of January last year. And I think that was what I would like to think was the opening of the floodgates. They've taken rather a long time to open. What became apparent, I think, um, that the fraud wasn't 250 million or 245, which we prosecuted on. Um, it was near a, a billion on this one particular um, uh, bank. It was an interesting fraud that they were defrauding not only the bank, but their clients at the same time. So I think it was a huge degree of incompetence by the bank. Um, but it also came out um, that there were a vast number of other victims from RBS and Lloyd's itself on a huge scale. Um, RBS, the GRG division of that, I don't know how many companies went into it. It was something like 16,000. And only a very, I'm not absolutely certain of that figure, um, I think only 10% ever got out of GRG. Now, you'd think if these were toxic companies that were collapsing, GRG would be losing money. They made an enormous profit. And the head of that is now the chief executive of Santander, which I find um, personally extraordinary. And that was said in the House of Commons by Sir Vince Cable. There was an interesting... Um, I think sidelined all of this, that most police forces do not have the money or the capacity or the capability to take on fraud cases. When you find you're legislating or prosecuting a bank, 
they have the smartest London solicitors. They, are, they will have unlimited money to spend on, on their legal cases. Um, the, the police have said it cost us seven million pounds. We didn't get much of that back. We got two million pounds back from the Treasury, uh, from the Home Office. Um, no private individual can really take a case against the bank. They will put the case off, they will come up with every problem, and even people who are still well off after they have had all their companies taken away from them, or their home, or so anything, they will still, the case will be put off and put off. And there's this six-year statute of limitations, which the bank is well aware of on cases, and they play on that. Um, I have seen a major, I say companies, in, in the, into the several hundred million pounds that have been removed off people, and they simply are outlawed in the courts. And I don't think um, the courts are remotely supportive, and I think you've heard that in the case we've just heard. The repossessions from Lloyds and RBS are still going on. I went to see um, Dame Linda Dobbs, who's doing the internal inquiry of Lloyds, the other day. And as I walked down Doughty Street to go and see her, I was rung up by a lady who was having her property taken away as she spoke to me on the phone. The police were there, the uh, people, the bailiffs were there, and the, I couldn't do anything about it. There was a court order. Do I think that court order was a fair one? Had it been got at properly? No, I don't for a moment think it had been. But there was nothing I actually could do about it at that stage. I think, um, and it's a personal opinion, that something has gone seriously rotten in the leadership of some of our major banks at the moment. One staggering thing is that there is no but on the boards, I think there is one person on the board of our major banks, clearing banks, who's a qualified banker. They simply are not qualified bankers. They're all accountants or just businessmen who have ended up. And, of course, they are making absolute millions. And their legal expenses are not paid by them. They're paid by their shareholders. Lawyers ran up a bill. I believe it was by 900 million for lawyers last year. And one wonders whether it's protecting the banks or the boards of the banks. And I um, have considerable doubts of that. I think there are a number of things we need to do to put a stop to this. Um, I think we've got to have a proper Chapter 11 system in this country, that you can't bankrupt a company overnight. Every other country has one. We don't have one. I think you've got to remove the statute of limitations um, in bank cases, that they can't deliberately put off cases indefinitely, say it runs out of time. I think you've got to have a proper tribunal system set up to sort out compensation for the people that have been defrauded. I think it should be compulsory that at least half the board of a bank should actually be qualified to be bankers. I think you've got to put a stop to this unlimited personal guarantees that are outrageously abused. People with small debts who are bankrupted then have their assets stolen off them that are worth many, many times their original debt. And that is divided up between the cronies, in my view, of um, between, uh, as we've heard, the um, insolvency pra practitioners and others. And vast sums of money simply disappears. Where did all the money go from, Lloyd, uh, from the HBOS case? I think probably at least so six or seven hundred million went straight abroad. abroad, abroad. We, um, I think, are only recovering about 15 million pounds out of a vastly bigger sum at the moment. Who made the money and where's it sitting? And again, I come back to that we don't have the capacity or the capability really to investigate fraud properly. Um, I think there is a massive problem in our regulatory authorities. The two major ones um, are the Financial Conduct Authority and the Financial Reporting Council that's meant to keep an eye on auditors. I find it quite extraordinary that the, the um, chairman of the Financial Conduct Authority, until the beginning of this month, was a very senior partner of KPMG that did the audits of the HBOS bank. They overlooked a fraud that approached a million pounds and a multi-multi-billion pound fraud, prob uh, whole, probably approaching 40 billion in the accounts. The man went on to be chairman of the Financial Conduct Authority. The chairman of the Financial Reporting Council that keeps an eye on the auditors gave KPMG a clean bill of health last year. His previous job was chairman of Lloyd's when this was going on. 
And so how on earth do people expect to get justice for a system like this? Now, I go from this meeting this afternoon, I've got a meeting with Andrew Bailey, who's the chief executive of the Financial Conduct Authority, and he's asked me to go and see him. And we're going to have a very interesting conversation, I think. I don't know quite how we stop this. Um, I am now talking at the most senior level of government, and I mean that. In 2013, there was an internal report written within Lloyd's called the Turnbull Report. It was commissioned by Lloyd's, though they now deny it was commissioned by them, but they did because I've got their internal emails. Um, and that lays out quite clearly what went on within Lloyd's Bank. And they, Lloyd say, it's not only did we not commission it, but it's an unsubstantiated report. Well, it was written three years before they'd admit to a fraud that is clearly laid out in this report. So it is pretty well substantiated. Now, the Financial Conduct Authority has sat on that report for several years, for three years anyway. I'm made absolutely certain now that it has gone to the Home Office, it has gone to the Serious Fraud Office, and I hope that something will be now done about it. Um, I'm by no means convinced that that is going to do it. I, I need to be called in front of the Treasury Select Committee and ask the right questions, and I then, under parliamentary privilege, can reveal most of the information. And I, it is absolutely devastating. Um, I think the banks have got into a, a mindset now that they're above the law and they can get away with it. And the insolvency practitioners, um, their lawyers, the valuers, how are houses that are valued at 1.5 million suddenly valued at 400,000 and flogged off? This is the sort of thing that has gone on time and time again. And there is something absolutely rotten. And I think Parliament you know, is aware of this. There was meant to be a debate about it in the House of Commons yesterday, but it's had to be put off for a fortnight because there was an emergency debate on Syria. Um, I think that um, will be an interesting debate. I went to a debate about it a month ago. Um, it's the only time I've heard all seven parliamentary parties represented in the House of Commons all agree that something had gone extraordinarily wrong within our justice system. There's one thing them agreeing and another getting some action out of it. And my concern about, under all of this is that I think the Home Office would like to do something about it. I think the Ministry of Justice would. I don't actually think the Treasury wants to do anything about it. And the Treasury controls the regulatory authorities. And it was interesting that last year, the Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, Andrew Tyre, wrote to Philip Hammond, it's an open letter, it's not a secret, and said, um, you cannot go on closing down our inquiries into these things. And he got a letter back from Philip Hammond and said, oh, yes, I can. Under the Financial Services Act or whatever it was, I think it was of 2012, I'm allowed to do this. It was passed by an Act of Parliament. Well, of course, you know, it was probably in an annex to an appendix to an annex on page 562. And it certainly wasn't understood by the members of Parliament when they signed up to it. And so we don't have a proper investment system of regulatory authorities, in my view, at this time. Um, and I think also they're far too small. The um, estimate, which is now quoted by the National Crime Agency, I may add, and I pressed them into this number, I don't think they'd even thought about it before, is the University of Portsmouth in 2016 put the amount of fraud in this country at 193 billion. Now, if you think we'd pay off our national debt in no time at all if we didn't have it, and I don't think it's very expensive to stop it. I think we need to spend probably 500 million, which is what, 0.5, uh, half of 1% of the amount. You need to set up at a regional level, um, proper uh, regional policing level, um, serious fraud offices, which look at the frauds properly. At the moment, my superintendent who deals with this our sort of fraud officer senior, but she's also looking at child sexual exploitation and things. We need a dedicated, experienced team to look at these things, and we simply don't have it at the moment at any level of government. The serious fraud office is tiny. Action fraud in the City of London get paid, I think it's something like 15, 16 million a year. Serious fraud office is about 35, 40 million. 
This is to tackle a problem that runs nearly to 200 billion. We've got to spend money on this, and it's got to be money not from the Home Office, but from the Treasury. And I think it is the Treasury who are putting the brakes on this, and I'm doing everything I can to stop this and get some movements. Anyway, it's got quite a long way to go, this one, but I think we're closer to getting something done about it than we have been for a very long number of years. Thank you. That was, that was um, great testimony. Thank you for that. Um, some of the maths I'm familiar with. Just a quick question. I realize there's some restrictions and that you'll be following on and that uh, today's basis is mainly to just discover if there's a prima facie reason to continue. Mm -hmm. um, the, you, you mentioned there that the, the uh, chairman of the FCA, um, the Financial Conduct Authority, was at uh, KPMG. Um, did you say that he left this month? Um, I, he left the Financial Conduct Authority this, this month. month. Um, KPMG, incidentally, audited Carillion and the Co-op Bank. <laughs> it, it, I mean, I, but if there's any other question from a justice first. Just, uh, you mentioned, Commissioner, that you'd be giving uh, more information when you were giving it to a parliamentary committee. Yeah. Uh, is that that if you give the same information outside the protection of Parliament, uh, that there's a risk of you being sued to keep you quiet? Um, in, in my view, yes, yes, because I can only really release what was released in the trial against HBOS um, if it wasn't released. And, and the interesting thing about the trial of HBOS, there was no pros point in prosecuting 800 million or a billion because you can't get more than 15 years for fraud. And you're going to get that whether it's 245 million. <laughs> And we got the maximum sentences on uh, two people for, for that. So it, it was limited. Thank you. If I could draw the uh, Justice's attention to page seven of the submitted testimony, and, and Commissioner, mm -hmm. I can hand these to you, which yeah. we had previously discussed. Yeah. What we have here are three documents. These three documents are documents that were accepted by a series of registrars barristers and judges as completely genuine and they have been marked up by a certified public accountant who has identified numerous falsities in that person's judgment that would have warranted in a properly run system the immediate rejection of these governments. Now I have shown them to the Commissioner prior to our proceedings beginning because it is certainly not my intent to cause any discomfort so I would be grateful, Commissioner, if you care to comment in general terms uh, on your preliminary thoughts as to whether these documents should have been questioned by the process in place. Um, yes, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, but looking at them, I would have thought clearly they should have been. And I have to say that this seems to have been replicated in probably thousands of other cases where uh, things have been taken before courts, and um, they've been, I don't know whether the judges and registrars just think the banks are always being honest and the IPOs are being honest, but they seem to always side with one side on this one. And um, I, I, I think it is a national scandal, this actually. Thank you very much. Um, I have just two more questions. It, it seems like it's impossible to prosecute forgery in the United Kingdom. Uh, should there be a process? Is this the regulatory process that you've been speaking of as a solution? Um, yes, I think it is possible to prosecute it, but I think it comes back to the capacity of the police. If the police don't prosecute it, nobody else is going to. And um, the police have been cut. Um, my own budget for policing in Thames Valley has been cut by 100 million a year, uh, which is a substantial sum. Um, and so with all the other things we are covering, Fraud it has not been a high priority for policing. I think it, the damage it does, the victims of it, is absolutely horrific. If, and it, it destroys you know, families and homes are taken away. I mean, the Turners, Paul and Nicky Turner, had 22 attempts to take their house away over 10 years. They couldn't afford to heat their water. Um, and it wasn't until we got the prosecution, the guilty verdict last year, and the bank admitted it, that they started to talk to them and, and they have been compensated now. 
But if we hadn't done that court case, Lloyds would still be fighting them, would have taken away the house by now, knowing it was a fraud. I, I'm, uh, first off, let me say, your authenticity and your integrity really come across very strongly, and I'm deeply grateful for what you're doing. Um, now, all of these people are, they're instruments that pay out on fraud and dishonesty by these insolvency practitioners. But it seems impossible to actually get them to pay out. Uh, do you have any comment on what measures someone like Michelle Young might take to challenge the uh, integrity of this process? I, I think it's extremely difficult when you're up against uh, a bank defending itself and, and paying very often, you know, uh, for the money for other people who are, you know, have worked in collusion with them, in my view, um, to defend these cases. I think um, the problem is that neither the FCA nor the SFO are really able at the moment to take these cases on. Um, they don't, again, have the capacity or the capability. We have to put a lot more money into it. And I think if you put £500 million pounds a year into tackling fraud rather than less than £100 million, if you couldn't save... 50 billion in the first year, I would be very surprised. You only need to put one or two senior bankers in jail for a start and set up something like the um, we had in the Far Eastern places, independent committees against corruption, which we don't have. Mm. Um, I, I, I once had to, um, in another life, when I was much younger, I was chief of staff of our uh, sort of overall um, intelligence system in the, in the Far East, and I came in well after it had happened, but it became clear that the Hong Kong police were corrupt, and you couldn't do away with an entire police force because we'd have had complete mayhem. And what we had to do was take out some of the big names and draw a line and have an amnesty and put in a proper uh, independent committee to stop corruption, and it was stopped very successfully. And I think we're going to have to do something to, on that scale um, with, with our banking system at the moment, but I don't think it can go on in its present state. Thank you. Justin, please. Um, actually, I think we should uh, ask for a brief recess, and I'll explain the reason later. But thank you very much for the testimony, and, and um, very good luck. Thank you. So we'll declare a 10 minute recess. <laughs> are the power behind the ITNJ. Add your voice. Sign the treaty.